The mob, organized crime, has been a force in Hollywood almost since the advent of talking pictures. Fifty years ago, when actors like Edward G. Robinson and Paul Muni were playing gangsters in movies like Little Caesar and Scarface, the mob was already in Hollywood playing for real. Everybody knew it, certainly the Justice Department did, but it wasn't until just a few years ago that any real effort was made to prove it. We uncovered a strong outside connection with the East Coast families, the Genovese family, the Gambino family. We uncovered a strong presence uh, with Chicago organized crime, with a syndicate at uh, various levels within the motion picture and television industry. Until earlier this year, Richard Staven was in charge of a major Justice Department FBI organized crime strike force investigation into the mob's infiltration of Hollywood. We have been led to believe, not only through this investigation, but other investigations, that the mob has moved off to the streets and they're in the boardrooms of corporate America. The investigations of the mob in Hollywood touched on a number of entertainment companies, but two of the most revealing investigations focused on people associated with one studio in particular, MCA. MCA stands for the Music Corporation of America, a three billion dollar entertainment conglomerate known for its Universal Studios which produces network television programs like Murder, She Wrote, as well as movies. MCA also has a record division which offers up the songs of superstars like Elton John, and still another division entertains millions of tourists annually at its Universal Studio theme park. So how did the mob turn up doing business with MCA? The first evidence was uncovered four years ago by Marvin Rudnick, one of Richard Staven's colleagues in the Justice Department strike force. Rudnick was prosecuting a man identified by the FBI as an organized crime figure, Salvatore Sal the Swindler Pacello. When a witness told him that Pacello, a wholesaler in seafoods and meat, was now in Hollywood doing business with MCA. Mr. Pacello was arranging multi-million dollar transactions at MCA Records, which uh, was in one of the large divisions at MCA. I was floored. I was surprised that somebody who would be involved in the meat business and had these organized crime ties would be doing any kind of business over in Hollywood. I mean, MCA is not in the meat business. No, and uh, Pacella was also in the pizza business on the side, and he was also in the ice cream business. He wasn't selling pizza and, and ice cream and, and sausage and meats to, to Universal's kitchens. No, not, not, not based on what we found. Did he have any background in this business? Uh, that was what got us interested. Uh, there was no reason to believe that Sal Pacella knew anything about the record business. Rudnick discovered and reported to the Justice Department that Pacello, the racketeer meat and pizza man turned record executive, had the run of MCA's offices, met with top MCA executives, and that Pacello had arranged a series of multi-million dollar deals, including MCA's purchase of the prize chess checker record catalog giving MCA the rights to the songs and music of black blues and rock and roll artists of the 50s and 60s. Bill Needlesater was a reporter at the Los Angeles Times investigating the record business. He reported that Pacello was involved in the distribution of millions of MCA records called cutouts. Cutouts are records that are sold in bulk at discount because they are no longer in demand. Needle Sater reported in the LA Times that Sal Pacello, the alleged mobster, was MCA's favorite middleman in the cutout record business. The MCA, through Sal Pacello, sold about five million cutouts uh, to a Philadelphia budget distributor uh, from a, for about a million and a half dollars, 35 cents a piece. What happened was when he got the records, received them in his warehouse, he found that the better titles had been taken out. They had creamed his load in, in cutout parlance. The songs that would, the records that would sell easiest. Yeah, the ones he could get two and three dollars for, or a dollar. So he refused to pay and got his face broken. This is an FBI photo of the distributor's face after he was visited by a mafioso from New Jersey. Pacello made hundreds of thousands of dollars doing business with MCA, and much of it went into the accounts of this company, a partnership between Pacello and two members of the mafia. One of his partners was this man, Fritzi Giovanelli, who was recently jailed for killing a New York City police detective. MCA also advanced Sal Pacello $180,000.
Facing an audit, an MCA executive asked Pacello for three checks to cover that amount. Checks that were never cashed, but were kept locked in an executive's desk drawer in case they were needed. An MCA got three checks for Pacello for $180,000. That's right. They were undated? They were undated. MCA knew the checks were no good? There wasn't enough money to cover them? They knew at the time they took them they were worthless. How did Sal Pacello get inside MCA? Did the company's executives know he was in the mob? MCA's executives insisted they didn't know, but they and others involved in the Pacello record deals told Marvin Rudnick contradictory stories about how the mobster got into MCA. To try and get to the bottom of the MCA Pacello connection, Rudnick checked to see if Pacello had paid taxes on income from doing business with the company. He hadn't. And so, with the support of the IRS and the endorsement of the Justice Department in Washington, Rudnick launched a grand jury investigation. In July of 1987, the grand jury indicted Sal Pacello for evading taxes on the money he made doing business with MCA. And while the press was preoccupied with the Pacello MCA case, Richard Staven and the FBI were involved in still another investigation of the mob's infiltration of Hollywood. Every day there was a surprise to me in this case. Every conversation was a surprise to me in this case. Every day there was a new mafia figure that surfaced. We still don't know the full breadth of the mafia's involvement in Hollywood. Richard Staven, now in private practice in Los Angeles, agreed to talk with us about his investigation and what has appeared on the public record about FBI wiretaps involving Hollywood, the mob, and one high-ranking MCA executive. Uh, the conversations spanned uh, what we perceive to be potential insider trading violations concerning MCA's stock. Certain conversations also dealt with the motion picture that was to be produced on the life of Meyer Lansky, wherein there were two competing organized crime families that were trying to control this production, the Genovese family and the Gambino family. They wanted to control the production of the movie? Uh, they wanted to control the production, and by that I mean they wanted to control who actually did produce the movie. There were two competing, competing stories that were being pitched around town. One by Eugene Giaquinto, vice president of MCA's home video division. Giaquinto is seen here with MCA's president, Sidney Scheinberg. And Giaquinto from MCA wants to make the movie. And he's got connections with? The Gambino family in New York. And on his wiretap phone, Giaquinto got more specific. Giaquinto, at that point, said he was going to enlist the aid of John Gotti and the Gambino family in New York to intercede on their behalf to make sure that they could produce their movie. The competing project belonged to the actor James Kahn, who played Sonny, the hot-headed Corleone in the Godfather movies. Kahn's project was the one the Genovese crime family wanted produced. And the FBI heard this in wiretaps? That's correct. What does that say about mob control, at least in this instance, here in Hollywood? The Mafia looks at films about the Mafia as though they have a proprietary interest in it. And if a movie is going to be made about the Mafia, you had better consult with the Mafia before you make that movie and pay your tribute. Not only did the mob want to control movies, they wanted to control the packaging of the home videos. According to Staven's investigation, MCA spent millions of dollars printing home video cassette boxes like these with a mob-affiliated company. The company was affiliated with this man, Edward Chandra, a mafia underboss who Giaquinto described on those FBI wiretaps as his uncle. The conversations are quite clear that Giaquinto was the mafia's man within MCA, whether or not known to MCA executives or not. But it was quite clear that in time, the mafia had hoped to get Giaquinto in the position where he was running the entire studio. Richard Staven says that based on the public record in these two criminal cases, MCA should have known that their vice president and their home video division were doing business with a mob-affiliated printing company. And one high-level source in MCA agreed. He told us that objections were raised inside by executives as to why Giaquinto could use a printing company 3,000 miles away in New Jersey. Despite the questions, MCA's top management, including Chief Executive Lou Wasserman, seen here with Giaquinto, made no changes. And according to those FBI wiretaps, Giaquinto, MCA's vice president, not only bragged about his mob ties, 
he made a perhaps more damaging admission, that he was aware that four movies were made with laundered money, the proceeds of crime. In Hollywood, the deal is what counts. It's the bottom line. It's getting the picture produced on budget and within the allotted shooting time. Nobody asks how and nobody asks where the money's come from. MCA's chief executive and board chairman is Lou Wasserman, considered the most politically powerful Hollywood mogul, a confidant of presidents. Neither Wasserman nor any member of MCA's politically powerful board of directors, a board that includes former Senate Republican leader Howard Baker and former Democratic National Committee chairman Robert Strauss, would talk with us on camera about these allegations, nor would any executive or attorney for MCA. And neither would Eugene Giaquinto, who was suspended by MCA when the Staven FBI probe first became public. But MCA did respond to at least one of those government investigations, Marvin Rudnick's probe of Sal Pacello and MCA records. MCA complained to the federal government about Rudnick's legal ethics and conduct in court. The Department of Justice turned on me. I mean, one day um, they liked me, the next day they didn't. Why? A new lawyer was hired on behalf of MCA. It was a lawyer from Washington named Mr. Hundley, Bill Hundley. That new MCA lawyer, Bill Hundley, just happened to be the former head, in fact, the man who started the Justice Department's organized crime section, the group Marvin Rudnick worked for. So it was easy for Hundley to call up Rudnick's bosses and meet with them over lunch. Hunley, a law partner of MCA board member Robert Strauss, freely admits that they discussed MCA, Marvin Rudnick, and the Pacello case. And it wasn't long after that that Rudnick was called back to Washington for a meeting at headquarters and given the word. My chief said, Bill Hunley uh, is a friend of the strike force and pointed to a picture on the wall. And he said, that's Bill Hunley. If he starts complaining about you, you've got troubles. Jim Waltz, now in private practice, served in the Justice Department with Marvin Rudnick. Here's a guy who's a prosecutor who discovered evidence of organized crime and was investigating it and ferreting it out. It's that simple. And he stepped on toes. People didn't like it. MCA, who's got a lot of money, hired a lot of legal talent, and somebody was gotten to in the Department of Justice. Was it clear after this meeting that the Justice Department and someone high up in the Justice Department didn't want you going after MCA? That was clear to me. I mean, it's not like they brought me into Washington to give me some kind of a medal. Rudnick says his chief told him to leave Los Angeles to accept a transfer, and therefore give up being the prosecutor in the pending trial of Sal Pacello. The Department of Justice had already sent MCA this letter assuring the company it and its executives were not a target of the Pacello investigation. Despite the pressure, Marvin Rudnick refused his chief's suggestion and returned to Los Angeles, where he successfully prosecuted and convicted Sal Pacello for evading taxes on his income, $300,000 he made doing business with MCA. Despite his victory in the Pacello trial, last July, the Department of Justice fired Marvin Rudnick. They gave no cause, no basis, no justification, and it was just totally improper. They gave me no hearing. This was all designed as part of some way of trying to, to discredit the case. Ed Dennis is head of the criminal division in the U.S. Department of Justice. He fired Marvin Rudnick. We wanted to know why. I will not discuss any personnel matters involving Mr. Rudnick or any, anyone else in the department. Dennis rejected any inference that MCA's use of an ex-strike force chief, Bill Hunley, was improper or that it might have influenced the Department of Justice's decisions concerning MCA or the firing of Rudnick. These personnel matters really, when you look at them, came down to personality disputes invo involving uh, really matters that, uh, that are perhaps unfortunate, but uh, they certainly don't uh, raise the implications that, that you've brought out here. Personality disputes, he didn't get along with somebody? That's basically it. This is not a matter of personality dispute. This is a matter of integrity. There's no personality matter involved here. All we were trying to do is get to the truth. The real question in this case is, how did a man, a mob guy, with no prior experience in the record business, get into MCA? I mean, the priority should be to look toward 
what the mob influence is, wherever it is. And Richard Staven, he is no longer with the Department of Justice either. He wasn't fired, he resigned last June. Staven didn't want to tell us why, but sources in the Justice Department and the FBI say he was frustrated over delays and objections raised inside the department. Objections to the issuing of indictments in his probe of the mob in Hollywood. Is there an ongoing investigation into possible mob influence through Sal Pacello or others into MCA? The, uh, that our uh, investigations and so far as mob influence are concerned are, are always open. They never, they never close. What does MCA say about all this? The only thing they would put on the record with us was a statement that included that they never knowingly participated in business ventures with members or associates of organized crime. About one of those members of organized crime, Sal Pacello, the mob's man in the record business, he went to jail last month. And that mob-affiliated printing company? MCA says it no longer does business with it and that it has terminated its relationship with Eugene Giaquinto. And that movie about Meyer Lansky that two different crime families wanted a hand in? That has yet to be produced. MCA also said in its statement that irresponsible, unauthorized, and illegal public statements by former government prosecutors have unfairly damaged the company. Well, information one of those former government prosecutors, Richard Staven, turned up, sources in the Justice Department tell us may still result in a federal grand jury issuing indictments. And Marvin Rudnick, he's now in private practice. His last job for the Justice Department was to put Sal Pacello in jail.